Hawkins Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything, geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redmond. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I am your host, Pierce Redman, and you can find this show here at American Freedom Radio, AmericanFreedomRadio.com, as well as on my website, which is PorkinsPolicyReview.com. And uh, over on my site, I have all the other uh, stuff I do, the uh, Porkins Great Game podcast, CIA in Hollywood, interviews, all that kind of stuff. So definitely check that out. Um, well, Oh, uh, boy, today's episode, huh? <laughs> um, I was just, uh, I was just chatting with Danny, uh, before we, we started the broadcast and I was just telling him a bit of a, a, a rough week. Um, I guess I'll, I guess I'll start by saying thank you, uh, thank you to Chuck Ocelli and Robbie Martin for joining me last week. That was a, a, a show that I'm, I'm very proud of. Uh, it did get, Sort of the response that I anticipated, so uh, people either loved it or hated it. Um, but I, you know, I think it's it's important to make those sorts of episodes and to kind of, uh, you know, draw a line in the sand, state uh, your your beliefs, your morals, your whatever. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I hope uh, people got something out of that episode. As I said, I know it was a bit of a mixed bag in terms of the response, but. Thank you to everybody who did appreciate the episode. Um, you know, all the, the great comments and emails and stuff that I did get about it. Uh, very appreciative of all of that. And, uh, oh, well, I guess I, before we, we kind of jump into the episode, which will be kind of, uh, kind of related to uh, some of the stuff we talked about last week, uh, I do want to mention, uh, thank you to all of my Patreon subscribers. So thank you, RNR, Joshua, Jacob F., Sally, Howard, Lee, Jake, Jess, uh, Jacob W, Walter, Peter, Hassan, Janice, Quentin, Pamela, Arthur, Matthew, JC, Ben, and Marianne. Thank you all so much for uh, becoming subscribers, for supporting the show. Of course, if you want to support my work, you can always go to patreon.com slash Pierce Redmond and you can uh, become a supporter. Also, uh, please, if you enjoy the show that you hear on American Freedom Radio, become a subscriber uh, to AFR. You can uh, you can uh, sign up for a monthly donation on PayPal. You can do a one-time donation. It helps out a lot, uh, and I, I know it, it helps uh, Danny, who, of course, is the uh, the man behind the scenes with all of this, who does a tremendous amount of work for all of us. And, and I guess in this, this sort of post-Thanksgiving uh, <laughs> time right now, I'm very thankful for Danny uh, for the uh, chance to to do the show and for all the opportunities. So, if you uh, if you have a couple extra bucks, uh, if you want to help support the AFR, you can do that. Of course, at AmericanFreedomRadio.com, you can find the um, uh, PayPal links and you can start there. And uh, the bonus podcast for PPR uh, listeners is uh, has been recorded. Uh, it should, uh, fingers crossed, be out sometime tomorrow, probably in the evening. Uh, I will try and get a little bit better about getting those out, uh, you know, at an earlier date. Uh, but again, just a, a lot of stuff going on here with the, with the show and with my, you know, work schedule and whatnot. But, uh, I think, uh, the subscribers will be excited. Uh, we spoke with, uh, Brian Heiss, who of course has been on the show several times before to discuss his research into the OJ Simpson trial. And for this, uh, bonus podcast, um, Brian actually got a, a full copy of Nicole Simpson's infamous uh, 911 call back in 1993. Uh, for anybody out there, this is the phone call where uh, OJ has, uh, uh, you know, gotten into her house and he's screaming and ranting and raving, um, or that at least that's how the media has portrayed it. And uh, Brian actually cleaned up the audio. You can hear very clearly uh, that, you know, OJ makes numerous references to Nicole's drug use to some of the unsavory characters that she is surrounding herself and their kids uh, with. And Brian has been generous enough to uh, allow uh, for all of the uh, $5 uh, uh, monthly subscribers who get the bonus podcast, they will also get exclusive access to the full 911 call uh, in a video format with subtitles. 
Uh, this has never been uh, publicly uh, available um, in the, the long form. There's been little, you know, two minute clips that have been uh, spread around the Internet. But this is the first time that the full 911 call can be heard in its entirety. Brian, uh, generously, as I said, will be allowing all of the subscribers exclusive access to this. And uh, just to tease it out a little bit more, but in uh, starting uh, in the month of January, Brian has a very special surprise to all of my subscribers. So, uh, you know, one dollar, three dollars, five dollars, whatever. Everyone will get access to um, some, some very exclusive material courtesy of Brian Heiss. So that's something to look out for as well. Now. Uh, what is uh, today's episode? Well, um, I guess uh, sort of along the lines of uh, some of the stuff that we discussed uh, last week, we, we obviously uh, talked about Pizzagate, and I will try and not talk about it anymore um, because I'm just uh, kind of done with that. But there's been a lot of scrutiny uh, in response to the Pizzagate targeted at art, particularly modern art. Or, or contemporary art, I guess we could say. Um, and uh, I think this is like a trend that I've seen more and more popping up in, um, in, the, alt, in the alt media, the alternative community, whatever. But uh, particularly in, uh, with the Pizzagate story, a lot of uh, scrutiny has been placed on, on artists like Maria, uh, Marina Abramovich, um, uh, the uh, Serbian artist whose name I'm, I'm going to butcher right now, Biljana uh, Jurjevic, who is the uh, painter uh, that uh, Tony Podesta collects a lot of his uh, art. You'll you'll know what I'm talking about. These are the very kind of disturbing paintings with kids and, and dogs and other things. Not all kids. Um, and of course, uh, also there's been a lot of scrutiny placed on uh, Louise Bourgeois, who is a, a sculptor and an artist, and uh, people will be familiar with the uh, sculpture, the Arch of Hysteria that she uh, made that hangs in uh, the, the, I think it's in Tony Podesta's uh, house with his wife. And people have um, pointed to these artists as part of some sort of secret cabal or that the art means something more. And I think there could be an element of that. I'm not uh, dismissing that, but I don't think that, and and maybe I'm, I'm going to, I might sound very snooty, um, you know, and, and like a real, you know, New York art person uh, right now. But, and this is just my opinion, and you can, I guess you can, you can target me later if you like. But I think that by and large, within the community, the alternative media community, I think there's a real disconnect when it comes to how they view art, particularly contemporary art, how they view the art world, and how the art world actually works, and why certain types of art have become so popular and so sought after. And I think this is especially the case with modern or contemporary art. And uh, in that sort of vein, I was sort of thinking about that, uh, you know, in the last couple of days. I thought that we could um, explore this a little bit more. And this is an episode that I have wanted to do for a while, uh, but, um, you know, wanted to do a little bit more work on it. And Admittedly, this is not going to be the uh, the fully polished version of the podcast that I envisioned. Uh, but I was just sort of at a loss for what to do. Uh, I was feeling a little kind of bummed out um, this past week, and uh, you know, I didn't I didn't get a guest or anything. So I thought we could kind of explore this, and particularly the um, the relationship between government or the state and uh, the proliferation of uh, modern art. And a lot of this uh, does trace back to the Cold War, to the 1950s, and particularly uh, with the abstract expressionist movement and the help and, um, I don't know, the, the, um, the sort of influence that the CIA gave them. And, uh, and this is real. This is an, an actual thing. This is, it's actually at this point now fairly openly, uh, spoken about. I was even openly kind of, uh, uh questioned back, um, in the, uh, very late 60s and, and then into the early 1970s. Um, people began to ask questions about this. And there is a link. And I think that in some ways, hopefully, um, that might kind of go towards explaining 
some of the art that we now see today. And, uh, uh, but I have no idea because I didn't, I didn't have enough time to uh, prepare for all this. So it may not, uh, totally make sense, but I think this is still an interesting, uh, topic and it's something that I'm very fascinated by. I, uh, I am a big, you know, fan of contemporary art, of modern art. I do like a lot of, uh, abstract expressionist, uh, work. Um, and, uh, and of course I'm always interested in the relationship that the Central Intelligence Agency has with culture. And this particular case, of the CIA getting involved in the abstract expressionist movement is interesting because it was it was done explicitly because of the Cold War. And I think uh, no one can really deny that the Cold War never really ended, just as the game might have changed a bit. The pieces have been moved around, but we're still in that sort of uh, world. We're still in that we're, – we're still viewing – cultural, political, you know, economic, uh, societal uh, norms and, and viewpoints through the lens of this sort of unending fight between the West or America and, uh, you know, the, the East and Russia, I suppose. And, uh, and I think that, that in some ways that might even explain to a degree why we see certain artists like Abramovich and, and others um, elevated to this elitist level, uh, but anyway, I guess we we can we can kind of uh, try and jump into to this episode. So uh, I am uh, going to basically be um, uh, reading through and and, and sort of uh, most of this is coming from uh, an excellent book called The Cultural Cold War: The CIA and the World of Arts and Letters, and it's by Francis Stoner Saunders, who's a, an amazing amazing academic. Uh, I can't uh, recommend this book enough. It's it's a really fantastic book. Uh, I think in the UK it is called um, uh, Who Paid the Piper? And then there's a, a subtitle to that that I can't remember. But in America it's called The Cultural Cold War, The CIA and the World of Arts and Letters. And uh, Frances Stoner Saunders is someone that um, Tom and I have uh, used a lot of her work in the past, Um uh, both from this book and from uh, articles that she's written about the CIA's influence in the Cold War, the Cultural Cold War is is a it's a huge book. Um, I haven't uh, actually had a chance to read all of it yet, but I have used it recently um, for the the uh, article that I'm writing uh, that I, I know I've spoken about on the bonus podcast, and um, so I, you know I'll tease it out a little bit here, but. Uh, Myself, Tom, and uh, a bunch of uh, other people who you will definitely recognize by name and some you won't. We are writing a, um, we're all writing uh, a series of articles that will be in an academic journal, uh, all based around the CIA and Hollywood uh, phenomenon. Uh, so I've used um, Saunders' book quite a bit. Excellent book, very well researched, and she's very, very reasoned in her approach to all of this. So, so I'm going to be kind of Going off of my notes, and uh, and this is the uh, this is the new I have the the brand new edition. Uh, I think it came out maybe a year or two ago, uh, and this is uh, mostly coming from chapter 16, which is called Yankee Doodles. Uh, but but let's let's kind of get into this. So uh, at the at the end of uh, you know World War II, and we're talking now the you know late 40s, 46, 47. Um, in the aftermath of all of this, um, you know, suddenly uh, Russia was a, became our enemy, um, became, a, you know, was no longer our friend. And the uh, political, ideological, the cultural lines were drawn in the sand very fast. And, uh, and you, get, you get the sense um, of, of that from reading Saunders' book in particular. And in a lot of ways, this was sort of the birth of the uh, definitely of the American empire, definitely of the intelligence state in America. But in a lot of ways, I think, you know, after World War II, when we had essentially won and we were now in uh, a position to exert the American empire, we kind of uh, began to reinvent ourselves uh, as, as a nation, as a superpower. And uh, there were lots of aspects to this that were sort of, um, new to the American public, and the CIA went about uh, poking and prodding and massaging certain elements and suppressing certain elements and pushing particular cultural norms. Now, 
when it came to um, modern art, which definitely, you know, uh, became what it is in the, you know, starting in the late 40s, uh, it was viewed very negatively um, by m- much of the public and including uh, people like President Truman. And uh, President Truman was, was a, a, a big art fan. He would um, he was, uh, uh, you know, notorious for waking up very early. Uh, when you know uh, in the White House, um, and he would go to the National Gallery, and he you know the stall obviously was closed, but you know they they let him in, uh, and he would spend um, you know a few hours sort of wandering around the National Gallery before uh, you know before it was open, before the day would get started, and, and uh, he had a great appreciation for art, although um, you know uh, not when it came to modern art, and uh, and this is a quote from President Truman's diary, which is. Um, uh, I think kind of illuminates this point. Um, and, uh, of course, I, sh- I now have to find it. <laughs> oh, yeah, so uh, this is from Truman's diary. Uh, and this is uh, after gazing at some uh, Rembrandts and, and others, you know, some of the great masters. Uh, he wrote this. It's a pleasure to look at perfection and then think of the lazy, nutty moderns. It is like comparing Christ with Lenin. Um, and uh, he would later go on to uh, uh, say, uh, referring to the Dutch masters, the, the, the Dutch masters make our modern day daubers and frustrated ham and eggs men uh, look just what they are. So um, this is, you know, a, a precedent set by the, the president himself um, that this, uh, you know, that, you know, the moderns were, I guess, uh, like Lenin and the, you know, great uh, masters uh, like Christ. So obviously setting up the um you know the the sides uh, in this argument and of course Truman was not the only one um uh, there were lots of other people in government that were very antagonistic towards modern art um one of the more famous uh people um is a uh Missouri a Republican uh congressman from Missouri George Dundaro who was very antagonistic uh he he believed that uh you know quote all modern art is communist um, and uh, and he would even, you know, kind of like go on, um, you know, he said, quote, cubism aims to destroy by design disorder. Futurism aims to destroy by the machine myth. Uh, Dadaism aims to destroy by ridicule. Expressionism aims to destroy by aping the primitive and insane. Abstractism aims to destroy by the creation of brainstorms. And surrealism aims to destroy by the denial of reason. And uh, he said these things in other um, uh, strongly worded statements actually, you know, on the floor of Congress. Um, so uh, there was this sentiment um, uh, amongst the public, but also echoed by people in government that modern art was dangerous, that it was communistic, um, that uh, there were even people uh, that floated the idea that, There were secret messages in the paintings disclosing locations of uh, government facilities. So, you you know, I guess the idea being that you had some, uh, you know, abstract painters uh, like, you know, painting whatever. uh, And this was really a code for their uh, KGB handlers back in Moscow. Now, um, and of course, you know, the, the idea that the Kremlin, that the Russians were controlling this. And this actually couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, as, as we as we will see now, much of the the brunt of these attacks were aimed at the abstract expressionists, and so we're we're talking about people like uh, Jackson Pollock, uh, Willem de Kooning, um, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, um, uh, you know, and, and a, a whole list of other people. I'm not going to you know li- list all of them, but you can look look up the abstract expressionist movement. You'll, Mark Rothko, a very another a very famous uh, expressionist. Um, now, many of these artists uh, had been involved in left-wing politics. A lot of them had worked for the uh, Federal Arts Project under the New Deal. So they were viewed as, uh, you know, lefties or, you know, pinko commies. Um, they espoused those sorts of ideas. You know, they, they attended meetings and things like that. So, again, amongst the public, which sees communism and the Soviet Union as this great threat, the connection that the abstract expressionists had was was kind of detrimental to them, or at least in in that in that sense. Now, interestingly, the CIA had a, a different opinion of this. 
they saw abstract expressionism as anti-communist, that this was really the ideology of freedom and free enterprise, which is a very big uh, um, component to this. They saw this as, you know, if you look at the Soviet Union, it was all, all of that art was about uh, realism, you know, Soviet realism. So you can look up, you know, uh, Soviet era paintings and stuff, and it's, it's, it's all, um, you know, it, it, they, they almost look, um, very much like, you know, advertisements. Um, it's, it's all realism. It's all about the, you know, the plight of the workers and defeating, uh, you know, the, the bourgeois, uh, capitalists and whatnot, and um, nothing like, say, a Jackson Pollock, which is, you know, to, uh, you know, dripping paint on a, a giant canvas. Um, and again, this was very much also the abstract expressionism, very important. This is a, a, a mostly an American um, creation. This is very opposite of the European aesthetics and very opposite to um, the art that was popular in Europe. And that's not like a, a a complete, you know, it's sort of a generalization, but for for all intents and purposes, uh, let's think of abstract expressionism as an American phenomenon. Now, um, and there's, well, and actually, we'll, we'll skip that. Sorry. <laughs> um, now, basically, though, the CIA did see this as the opposite. As I said, this was an idea of freedom. This was the liberty to create whatever kind of art that you wanted to. Whereas in the, you know, in the, the Soviet regime, uh, you know, it was, it was tightly controlled by the state. So the CIA saw what was going on in the abstract expressionist movement as the polar opposite to this. So therefore they wanted to, um, you know, get involved. And then the government in general wanted to get involved, uh, in this. And again, too, there was this sort of myth is created about, you know, what a, what a, a, a true American artist was uh, supposed to be about, and you know Jackson Pollock um, definitely fit into that kind of uh, mythos. So you you know Pollock is always kind of described as this almost like this cowboy figure. You know he's hard drinking and you know smokes a lot, and and he and and he has the freedom to do whatever he wants to do, and he doesn't take shit from anybody. And this creates this sort of again this this ideal of what. Uh, not only what the American artist is, but what the American is, what the American represents. So this is a very powerful tool that the um, government saw and essentially wanted to um, advance. And this began with the State Department, and this began uh, very openly. Um, so um, the State Department did um, uh, put up money. Uh, and stuff for several exhibits in the, again, in the late 40s, 47, 48, um, that was going to um, advance uh, the abstract expressionist movement and, and modern art as a whole. Now, this did kind of uh, run into some serious roadblocks because of people like uh, Congressman Dodaro and others who, again, viewed this as communist art. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, at one point, the State Department had an ex uh, exhibition about 1947 called Advancing American Art. It was going to tour through Europe and Latin America. Uh, this uh, included um, works of uh, people like George O'Keefe, um, Adolf Gottlieb, um, Archibald Gorky. Again, very, very famous, very prominent people in the abstract expressions movement. Now, the show didn't make it past, I think, Paris um, it, because of the, uh, the ire of the uh, – you know, uh, people at home who didn't want America to be seen as promoting this left wing kind of stuff. Uh, and actually, the, the show was canceled uh, in Paris and the art was sold at a 95 percent discount as government surplus. Uh, so this this kind of, you know, again, illustrates how involved the State Department was. They were actually selling off this art as government surplus. Uh, and again, the, you know, it was pointed out that many of these artists had dabbled in left wing politics uh, the State Department stated that you know, no American artist with communist or fellow traveling associations uh, would be exhibited at the government expense. And essentially, the State Department was kind of shut out from promoting this stuff. So uh, eager to showcase American art and culture, the State Department, the government turned to the recently formed CIA. CIA again formed by President Truman, 1947, uh, and uh, this um, 
this is a, a very, you know, interesting step in terms of, uh, of the CIA sort of culture war, which again began almost at the inception of the CIA. Uh, and, and it's, it's also very interesting too because this is another example of the CIA, uh, cozying up to left wing politics. Now, and this isn't just, you know, I, I know that I'm sure people listening to this are, oh, this is, you know, the, the cultural Marxists, uh, at the CIA who took over. But, you know, let's not kid ourselves. The CIA loves fascists too. And while they were, uh, promoting, uh, left wing artists, they were, of course, um, funding right wing fascist militias all over Europe. You know, that's like Project Gladio, Operation Gladio. Um, you know, they overthrowing Mossadegh and, uh, all that sort of, so it, it's a mixed bag. It's a, and again, that's what makes the, the CIA, um, you know, very, uh, interesting to look at. But, um, and the point man for, uh, much of this, um, was a man called Tom Braden, who was, uh, actually got, cut his teeth in OSS, the precursor. He was later the head of the, um, International, uh, Organizations Division, which was a subsection of the Office of Policy Coordination. He worked very closely with Alan Dulles. Um, people might know Tom Braden. Some of the older listeners might be familiar with um, CNN's Crossfire with Pat Buchanan. Tom Braden was the the other guy, the left wing guy uh, on that show, uh, and he was very influential in terms of the infiltration of the left wing. Um, he, he's he's famous uh, for being quoted in the Saturday Evening Post as um, saying, I'm glad the CIA is immoral. Uh, and this was in reference to, um, you know, like uh, what uh, students for Democratic Association, I, I can't remember the name, the CIA infiltrating that and, and other things uh, of that nature. Uh, and Tom Braden um, was also the uh, executive secretary of MoMA, of the Museum of Modern Art. And we'll get to that later. Um, but Through his, uh, while heading the International Organizations Division, he oversaw the creation of things such as the uh, Congress for Cultural Freedom. It's a very influential, very infamous CIA front that was um, uh, originated in Germany, but was later, uh, the headquarters was in Paris. And this was a a front that the CIA used to promote, um, you know, uh, uh, cultural things. So, Art, music, uh, writing, uh, you know, um, uh, criticism, all these sort of things. Uh, they used uh, the CCF as a front for all of this. Um, and again, and the CCF would, well, as you'll see, would, would, you know, put up money for these sort of things. But anyway, Tom Braden oversaw a lot of this. And Tom Braden um, was, uh, as I said, was sort of the, the point man for uh for all of the the sort of uh cultural and art stuff but very much so when it came to modern art and uh, again I'll, I'll read you another quote uh from Saunders book and this is Braden um responding to the uh the kind of pushback from people like congressman uh Dendera so this is a quote we had a lot of trouble with congressman Dendero. he couldn't stand modern art he thought it was a travesty he thought it was sinful he thought it was ugly He put up a heck of a fight about painting, and he made it very difficult to get Congress to go along with some of the things that we wanted to do. Send art abroad, send symphonies abroad, publish magazines abroad, whatever. That's one of the reasons why it had to be done covertly. It had to be covert because it would have been turned down if it had been put up to a vote in a democracy. In order to encourage openness, we had to be secret. And I, I hope that quote, you know, kind of sinks in, um, because that's very much um, a the, the kind of thinking that the CIA has when it comes to their promotion of, quote, democracy and freedom uh, that, uh, you know, in a democracy, the people would never want this sort of art. So we had to do it secretly. We had to influence them covertly. Uh, and, and, and Saunders um, has a, a great uh, little quote here as well that I'll read. Uh, and she says, here again was that sublime paradox of American strategy in the cultural Cold War. In order to promote an acceptance of art produced in and vaunted as the expression of democracy, the democratic process itself had to be circumvented. 
So, uh, you know, very, very uh, uh, interesting ideas again. So, as I said, the government turned to the CIA, and uh, the CIA did what it uh, usually does, and it turns to the private sector to achieve uh, these objectives, to promote this sort of art. Now, chief among them, of course, was uh, the Rockefeller family and MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, um, which uh, was, uh, you know, the Rockefellers uh, basically, you know, helped create it. Um, they, they funded it. Nelson Rockefeller was the president throughout the 1940s and 50s. Um, the Rockefellers, too, interestingly, like a lot of these rich elites, were very familiar with funding left-wing artists. So, you know, the Rockefellers, for instance, uh, did give money to Diego Rivera, um, uh, I, you know, and he created these, you know, very, uh, you know, workers' rights, uh, left-wing murals. And, of course, the, you know, the Rockefellers kind of hated him for that. But they were familiar with uh, the, the idea of funding these sort of left-wing things. And <clears throat> Now, um, and, and then again, this is what the Rockefellers were, were also key with, again, was helping to, again, reshape America, which always, you know, art is always funded by rich people. That's just the reality of, of, of or, I mean, of, the, the, you know, the, the art that we know of, generally speaking. You know, you look at the Medicis, look at, uh, look at the Rockefellers, look at all those sort of things. Um, but, um, the, uh, there was a time right now when that, that was not happening. Um, you know, in, in the post sort of World War II entering into the Cold War, there was, um, perhaps a disconnect, uh, between that. Um, and the people that were running the CIA, again, you've got all of these sort of, you know, Ivy Leaguers, uh, rich, uh, the sort of, you know, almost aristocratic, uh, type people. Um, they wanted to, um, you know, promote this stuff. They wanted to uh, push this. And um, there's a um, here, here's another. I know I'm reading out a lot of quotes to you, but I, I just kind of want to to kind of flesh this out a little bit. But um, the idea of this was uh, actually articulated um, back in uh, 1939 in uh, an article um, in a Partisan Review. Um, which also at, at one point took money from the, the CIA and the uh, Congress for Cultural Freedom. Um, but um, then this is uh, by uh, Clement Greenberg, who was a very influential art critic. Uh, he did uh, probably more than anyone else, uh, you know, one person to um, put abstract expressionism on the map. Um, and he also kind of created this ideological rationale for, um, you know, promoting this and for uh, for people becoming patrons of this movement. And uh, anyway, he said that um, he said that the avant garde had been abandoned by those to whom it actually belongs. Our ruling class in Europe, traditionally support was provided by, quote, an elite among the ruling classes from which the avant-garde assumed itself to be cut off, but to which it had always remained attached by an, um, an umbilical cord of gold. So, again, we have the art world sort of the avant-garde, the abstract expressionism uh, movement, seeming uh, to be kind of cut off from this, again, based on their politics, based on um, uh, their, their ideals, their moral values. And what Greenberg is saying is that, again, we need to, we need to emulate our, you know, former colonial overlords in Europe, and we need to embrace as a ruling class, we need to be upfront with this. We need to be funding this, and we need to be directing it. And essentially, um, he, he asserted that this had to be the American model, that the elites within America, like in Europe, they need to direct this art. And Tom Braden uh, liked Greenberg's approach a lot. And he, you know, he, he wrote about it. He talked about it with people. And he believed that art could only survive because of the rich and the powerful. And that they had a duty to instruct and educate, you know, what he would refer to as the ignorant masses. So very, very uh, important idea again. You know, I said at the beginning 
of uh, of this that uh, you know in many ways this was a, a rebirth or this was a new sort of creation of America a new a new version of America one in which people like the Rockefellers and MoMA and other um, influential people behind the scenes had to uh, make sure that this this type of art became uh, popular and that it was supported by the rich and the powerful. So as I said, um, the CIA turned to MoMA uh, to achieve much of this. And uh, and I'll just sort of run down some of the connections um, because, like, MoMA is, uh, you know, I'm sure anyone, is, you know, from New York or visited New York has probably gone to MoMA. Um, and uh, it, it's very interesting. Um, to It's almost like a who's who um, of, of CIA spooks and, and intelligence people. So, as I said, Nelson Rockefeller was the president of MoMA uh, from the 1940s to the 1950s. During World War II, he ran war. Uh, he ran the wartime intelligence agency for Latin America, which was known as the um, uh, CIAA, the Coordinator of Inter-American Affairs. Um, which is uh, interestingly, as a side note, is uh, the the CIAA is also named in a, a very uh, famous uh, OSS memo uh, from 1943 on motion pictures. And the coordinator of uh, inter-American affairs was seen as another one of these sort of subsections that they could use to influence films and, and get the CIA involved more and more in motion pictures. Now, by the early 1950s, um, Nelson Rockefeller was uh, receiving briefings on covert activities from Alan Dulles and Tom Braden. In 1954, Eisenhower appointed Rockefeller as his special advisor on Cold War strategy replacing C.D. Jackson, a very uh, prominent Cold War here. And he was also uh, on, he was a, a chairman of the Planning Coordination Group, which oversaw all National Security Council decisions. Uh, and and the, the, the Planning Coordination Group was also involved in CIA covert operations. So Rockefeller, um, again, perfect sort of person. He has a history with these people, and he's a very influential museum uh, with which to promote this stuff. Now, another interesting uh, uh, character, longtime trustee of MoMA, uh, who is also uh, the uh, uh, chairman of the board at MoMA, is a guy called John Jock Hay Whitney, who is a close friend of uh, Nelson Rockefeller. He was the director of uh, Rockefeller's motion picture division at the court uh, the, for the coordinator of inter-American affairs from 1940 to 1942. So uh, Whitney had some experience, um, you know, working uh, in film and propaganda. He joined OSS in 1943. Uh, 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 he was captured in uh, southern France by the Nazis in 1944, and he actually escaped, a very dramatic uh, escape uh, on train. Now, after the war, he set up J.H. Whitney and Company, which promoted free enterprise by getting financial backing for underdeveloped or risky businesses, which otherwise wouldn't be able to get any money. And through J.H. Whitney and company, he was able to, um, you know, give financial backing to artists, uh, give finance, you know, and essentially it was a CIA cover. But again, that idea of free enterprise, too, that's a, a very important factor in the abstract expressionist movement as it progressed. It was also, you know, it was seen as, uh, you know, these people, they could sell it to anybody. Um, they, they could ask, for, you know, exorbitant prices for the art. So very important to understand that. Um, and uh, Hey Whitney, uh, again, as I said, very close with Rockefeller uh, and knew this world, knew this world and, and knew how to use it. Um, William H. Jackson, uh, who was uh, Whitney's partner, in this free enterprise uh, organization, uh, was also a former uh, d deputy director of the CIA. Uh, and, and Whitney himself also held a position on the National Security Council's Psychological Strategy Board. So, again, very, um, you know, the, the MoMA is, it really is, it's like who's who. But it doesn't end there. <laughs> um, William uh, Burden who was MoMA's uh, chairman of the advisory committee in 1940 uh, and 1947. He was the uh, chairman of the, um, uh, the Committee for Museum Collections in 1957. He was the president of MoMA. He also uh, worked under Rockefeller at CIAA, and he was also, uh, William Burden was also the president of the CIA's 
Fairfield Foundation. And uh, the Fairfield Foundation, again, is a, a CIA front, very involved in the Cultural Cold War, uh, very involved in putting up money for uh, modern art exhibitions. And we'll, we'll get a little bit more to the Fairfield Foundation later. Now, uh, another very interesting character at MoMA was uh, René de Harnencourt. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, he was in charge of museum operations. Now, uh, what did uh, de Harnencourt do? He also worked, again, at, at Rockefeller CIAA Arts Division. He consulted for the National Security Council Operations Coordinating Board, which was, uh, uh, which is what the Psychological Strategy Board became. He regularly reported to the State Department, and according um, to uh, William Barden, was most likely the agency's main uh, contact at MoMA. So on a day-to-day level, you know, they're not going to call up Nelson Rockefeller every five minutes asking them something. Um, but de Harincourt was the, the agency's sort of go-to person. Um, and of course, too, it, you know, William Paley of CBS was a MoMA trustee, um, as was, uh, Joseph, uh, Werner Reed, who was, uh, uh, again at the Fairfield Foundation. Um, a really interesting character, uh, Oveta Kulp Hobby was a founding member of MoMA. Um, she was also on the board of the Free Europe Committee. The, uh, her family's foundation was used as a CIA conduit for, um, money to be, you know, uh, fun, you know, uh, funneled into, uh, different arts exhibits and things like that. And while she was the, uh, oh, excuse me, while he was the secretary, uh, for, uh, health and, uh, welfare under Eisenhower, um, her secretary was Joan Barden. Uh, who previously worked for Nelson Rockefeller and was, of course, married to the CIA's Tom Barden. And, uh, and, <laughs> uh, she, uh, uh, Joan Barden, uh, was also Nelson Rockefeller's executive secretary of MoMA from 1947 to 1949. So I know that's a lot of information. Uh, you might have to go back and, and re-listen to some of that, but, uh, just kind of want to set up the idea that, uh, MoMA itself is a, I don't want to say CIA front necessarily, but it was because, I mean, there were people there that were either unaware or, you know, uh, truly just cared about modern art. But the people at the top, the people that really made decisions on all of this stuff, very well connected to, um, to the CIA, to the intelligence state. And the CIA turned to them for an obvious reason. So suddenly... In the 50s, uh, MoMA begins promoting the abstract expressionists almost to a, you know, startling degree. Um, and there were a lot of people that were actually kind of pissed off about this, too, uh, because they were they, the, the abstract expressionists were, were kind of given like preferential treatment uh, over all these things. But basically what you do is you, you've got MoMA promoting them. So. You know, all of these famous artists, their artwork hangs in MoMA. MoMA has exhibitions. MoMA begins sending a lot of the, uh, you know, um, shows of, of various abstract expressionists to Europe. So they, they tour around Europe. Then you get groups like the Congress for Cultural Freedom. So what does the CCF do? Well, the CCF um, will sponsor a, in, uh, an art exhibition or they'll sponsor an art competition. OK, so they'll set up a, 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 a you know, an arts competition uh, and then you'll have groups uh, such as the Fairfield Foundation fronting the prize money for these. And of course, you know, who is the, the prize is going to go to, um, you know, some abstract expressionist. And that's not to, to sort of like, you know, um, discourage them. I, you know, they, they were making great art, but you do have this interesting group of people that are in the shadows, kind of beginning to direct it and kind of beginning to push it um, in a certain way. And and what kind of, you know, so so we have that in mind, right? I think we, you know, we, we, we've established that, let's say, that uh, this is a phenomenon, this is something that was going on. Um, now, what happens to, to this art? Um, what happens to the people involved in making this sort of art? Because now suddenly... Uh, you've got this movement, which was spontaneous, okay? 
and, and, and that's a big distinction. That's a, a distinction that Saunders makes throughout her book whenever she's talking about, you know, it, it, be it, uh, you know, modern art or, uh, you know, uh, classical music or things like Encounter Magazine even and, and some of these other things. There were people there that truly were just, you know, doing this. It was always going to happen. And I think there's a there's a, a desire or reaction in a lot of uh, you know alternative circles to say that oh the CIA created modern art well no they they never created modern art um, Pollock de Kooning uh, Gorky uh, Rothko uh, Louise Bourgeois all these people would have existed no matter what and they were making this art but the government saw that there was there was maybe some sort of benefit to getting involved in this. But I think something kind of interesting happens with this. So you have this desire by a group of elites that they want to become kind of almost like the Medicis of their time. They want to instruct the masses. Uh, they want to educate them that this is, this is the art that we all need to care about. Uh, that this is, this is good. Um, and they begin that influence, I think, almost begins to take on uh, its own momentum, and it, it, it kind of takes on its own form. And a lot of these um, abstract expressionists who had left-wing uh, views begin to change. So you you, you know you you start to see them politically changing. You start to see them uh, beginning to. Uh, you know, despise the Soviet Union. You start seeing them beginning to, uh, you know, want to um, uh, challenge the Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, you can't create, uh, you know, uh, art anymore. That everything is sort of controlled. And again, there's there's this um, push at the same time by many people in the government to, again, to continue to push modern art as the sort of art of liberty. Um, and, uh, you know, President Eisenhower himself once referred to modern art as, quote, a pillar of liberty. Uh, and he uh, he even addressed, um, uh, or he, in an address, where he was basically sort of directed at MoMA, he said, quote, as long as artists are at liberty to feel with high personal intensity, as long as our artists are free to create with sincerity and conviction, there will be healthy controversy and progress in art. How different it is in tyranny when artists are made the slaves and the tools of the state when artists become chief propagandists of a cause, progress is arrested and creation and genius are destroyed. Now, very interesting he's saying that while, of course, you know, uh, they were actively involved. The state was actively involved in the U.S. with, you know, pushing, pushing these artists, with promoting them, with making them become the sort of um, the ultimate uh, art, you know. And, and again, this idea that modern art was about liberty, it's about free enterprise, um, now, that idea, I think, is is more a creation of the CIA. I think that, you know, art, it, the abstract expressionist movement was not designed as this, um, you know, they, they didn't all sort of sit around and say, oh, you know, we're going to make liberty uh, art or something like that. Um, and, you know, along the same line, um, uh, people like George Kennan uh, echoed uh, very similar stuff on, you know, what he he referred to as free art ideology. Um, and, uh, you know, and he was constantly kind of criticizing, uh, Moscow and, and, uh, that, and, and he, he, he put out the idea, um, he told an audience of, of MoMA activists back in 1955 that they had a duty, quote, to correct a number of impressions that the outside world entertains of us, impressions that are beginning to affect our international position in very important ways. Uh, and then he went on to say the totalitarians recognized that only if they appeared outwardly to enjoy the confidence and enthusiasm of the artist could they plausibly claim to create a hopeful and credible civilization. And I find it sad that they should have to come to this appreciation so much sooner than many of our own people. So, again, the government is is not only funding this to a large degree. They're not only helping to make sure that it becomes very chic to uh, appreciate modern art, but they are creating this idea that it is a it is a battle. 
that this is the, that, that the, even the Cold War is even going to affect modern art, and that these artists have a a um, a, a duty to make sure that they you know help to defeat uh, the evil Soviets through the use of abstract expressionism. So that is a, a I believe, is a, a more a, a creation of the CIA. Again, um, we can see shades of that with uh, Hollywood, where um, uh, you know what is what is the CIA doing essentially uh, in the promotion of abstract expressionism? Well, they're promoting the ideals that they want people to view America as having. So they want people to view America as this place of free enterprise, this place of, uh, you know, freedom to do and say whatever you want. Uh, well, of course, um, you know, it, it couldn't be farther from the truth for a lot of people. You know, I mean, if you were, you know, black in the 1950s, who, who gives a shit if, you know, Jackson Pollock gets to do whatever the hell he wants to? Uh, and that's the same, the same sentiment in, um, their influence in, in, in the early days of Hollywood. Uh, the CIA had planted a, a whole number of uh, agents within um, Hollywood, and they also utilized people, um, you know, re- people that were that did work in Hollywood that were willing to kind of, uh, I don't know, sell their souls to the CIA. And uh, you know, they would do things like they would they would censor films that had uh, had racist depictions. Um, they uh, there was a um, oh god, I, I can't remember his first name. His last name is uh, Alsop. Uh, and he was, um, he used to censor a lot of stuff, uh, on behalf of the CIA in Hollywood. And he was, um, you know, he was always talking about, uh, you know, all, you know, his movies, um, they always had to have, quote, well-dressed Negroes. Okay, because they, they didn't want to portray the image that the Soviet Union played up all the time, that America was this bastion of racism. So again, and, and all of this has to be done covertly. They can't, uh, they can't, you know, come out and say this. Uh, they can't maybe uh, try to embrace these sorts of ideals, you know. And I'm not saying that that's what the CIA has to do, but uh, you know, instead, it, it all has to be kind of covertly, and it all has to be in this facade, you know. It doesn't matter if the reality of this is that, well, it actually sucks living in America, uh, or you know, there's there's a lot of uh, poverty, there's a lot of racism. There's a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, social problems. There's, uh, you know, all these sorts of other issues. That doesn't matter as long as we can project the image. Okay. And we can, and by projecting that image, I think in a lot of ways, they're also able to convince people that they are living in a world that they may not actually be. And that in and of itself is very powerful and is something that the CIA has always been, uh, willing to exploit. So again, uh, you know, average person may not really understand modern art back in the, you know, let's say mid fifties, but they understand that it is, it is something that only exists in America, in the land of the free and the brave. So that's a very powerful, um, idea. And that's a very, um, if you can convince people of things like that, uh, that is very powerful in and of itself because then you can kind of get away with whatever you want. So, again, while the CIA is promoting whatever, the left wing, let's say, with these artists, well, they're also, you know, overthrowing Mossadegh. They're overthrowing uh president of Guatemala. They're uh, training and funding Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, in Taiwan, they're, uh, they're helping to, uh, you know, rebuild the, you know, Nazis and fascists all over Europe. Uh, they're beginning to, uh, get uh, familiar with the heroin trade in Southeast Asia. Um, but again, the outward image is, is, is anything but that. And I think that's another important component in this as well. And, and moreover, um, it, it did in a lot of ways benefit them. Um, you know, uh, I'm just going to throw it out there. Soviet art, like paintings and stuff, kind of does suck in the sense that it is it is all about realism. Um, well, we're, we're coming up on the break right now. Uh, we'll continue this. I hope I'm not boring anybody, but I will be uh, back in a few minutes with more on this.
practically narcotic. Freedom. Oh, yes. I like very much radio. You're an American institution. American Freedom Radio. Are you feeling embarrassed and stuck because you can't focus or concentrate? I have a confession to make. I spent years unable to think clearly like I was in a fog. I was going through the motions, running my companies, and I hated feeling groggy and mentally sluggish. I couldn't get ahead like this. It's no secret the powers that be want us dumbed down. Chemicals, fluoride, our brains are under siege and we are experiencing lower IQs. But now there's a weapon to fight back and win. Introducing DNA Evolve, a revolutionary breakthrough in a category of cognitive enhancers called nootropics. I've been using DNA Evolve and couldn't feel better. For me, it works. It feels great to get things done again and get ahead. Try a free sample for yourself at DNAEvolveSample.com. That's DNAEvolveSample.com. Supplies are limited, so go to DNAEvolveSample.com right now. Did you know there are 3 million edible food plants on Earth and none have the nutritional value of the hemp plant? HempUSA.org offers you hemp protein powder. It does not contain chemicals or THC, is non-GMO, and is 100% gluten-free. Hemp protein powder burns fat, builds muscle, contains 53% protein, and feeds the body the nutrients it needs. Call 888-910-4367 and see what our powder, seeds, and oil can do for you only at HempUSA.org. HempUSA.org introduces three brand new detox formulations of micro plant powder. Brain Fuel for depression, bipolar disorders, and stress. Total Care, anti-cancer agent that cleans the liver and organs and increases memory. Rejuvenate, invigorates and heals the body, mind, and spirit. These products are your alternative to pharmaceuticals. Call 888-910-4367 and like us on Facebook. We ship worldwide only at HempUSA.org. What about show business? Show business, completely dishonest, corrupt, and full of shit, but in a nice way. <laughs> Plenty of expensive drugs and perverted sex. If you're going to be full of shit, might as well enjoy your work. <laughs> then you have the media. Not just the news media, let's include them all. The media are almost literally exploding with bullshit. Because they're located right at the crossroads of all the other bullshit. The media are made up of equal parts, advertising, politics, business, public relations, and show business. These people are sitting right at bullshit junction. There's enough bullshit in the media for Texas to open a branch office. And you still have enough left over to start two law firms and a Christian bookstore. What has American Freedom Radio ever done for us? Provide us for free education? Well, that's obviously effective. But apart from reversing the dumbing down of America... All the information they provide is free? What about the free podium for broadcast activists to speak from, man? Uh, exploiting uh, commonplace corruption? They help uh, vulnerable people who don't have a voice? I'll bring in light to uh, important information nobody else does. Or they never censor, hang up, or cut off their guests? Well, that's no fun, is it? Oh, they created a fantastic alternative media source during an era of bad, manipulative, and infiltrated mainstream and alternative media shows and scum? Okay, well, apart from the free education, free information, free podium for broadcast activists to speak from, exposing commonplace corruption, helping vulnerable people without a voice, bringing light to important information nobody else does, and creating a fantastic commercial free alternative media source in a sea of bad, manipulative mainstream and alternative media shows and scum, what has American Freedom Radio ever done for us? Donate to American Freedom Radio today. No rules. No rules. No taboo topics. No taboo topics. No fear of doom. No fear of doom. We are. We are. American Freedom Radio. American Freedom Radio. Ow. Hawkins Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything. Geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redman. Hey, 
everybody. Welcome back to Porkins Policy Radio. I am your host, Pierce Redman, here on American Freedom Radio. If you are uh, just tuning in, which I uh, thank you, Jenny, for just tuning in right now, uh, I have been uh, discussing uh, the the abstract expressionist movement and the influence that the CIA has had on it. Uh, and I know that I was really kind of rambling on there in the, the first hour, so, you know, bear with me. Uh, but we'll what were what were we kind of uh, talking about uh b- before the break but this this again this movement that was spontaneous in its initial phases uh but which was viewed by the CIA and by those in government as an excellent propaganda tool against the Soviet Union and against the uh perceived ideals of the Soviet Union so again soviet realism is bad uh, but uh, abstract expressionism is uh, is about liberty. It's about freedom uh, and, it, and and free enterprise again. Um, and uh, as I was saying, through groups like MoMA, through the uh, Congress for Cultural Freedom, through the Fairfield Foundation, all these sort of groups, abstract expressionism became the the it became what modern art is viewed as. OK, it um, and it became what everybody in the art world wanted to talk about. And again, it, be, it became very in vogue. It became very chic to collect modern art, uh, to collect abstract expressionist paintings. So, again, um, you know, uh, even though many of these artists uh, ostensibly were left wing or or uh espoused viewpoints, uh, you know, about the common man, about the working class man, even though Jackson Pollock has this persona of a cowboy, uh, suddenly they're making millions of dollars. Suddenly these, uh, um, you know, big, um, you know, Wall Street bankers need to, to purchase a Mark Rothko. OK, it needs to be hanging in their office. Uh, the rich and the famous suddenly are, uh, you know, it's very quaint. Uh, to have, uh, um, you know, a Jackson Pollock or uh, a de Kooning uh, painting in their house. And there was some backlash to this, okay? So um, in 1952, for instance, there were about 50 American artists, um, Edward Hopper, Charles Birchfield, uh, Jack Levine, many others. Um, they actually attacked MoMA uh, in uh, this uh, document that they called the Reality Manifesto. Uh, and they attacked them for, quote, coming to be more and more identified in the public eye with abstract and non-objective art, a dogma, okay? And they felt that this stemmed mostly from the Museum of Modern Art uh, and its unquestioned influence throughout the country. And, and the same year, uh, in 52, when that was published, um, a, the Communist Monthly, Masses and Mainstream, uh, also attacked abstract art and uh, what they referred to as the shrine at MoMA uh, in an article called, uh, quote, Dollars, Doodles, and Death. And uh, and Francis Connor Saunders, uh, you know, says that, that was eerily prophetic, and we'll, we'll get to, um, to why that was so prophetic. But what happens, though? Um, suddenly, these uh, these artists become very wealthy. Uh, many of them were made fun of for, you know, uh, looking uh, like, you know, ad executives and Wall Street men uh, while they're supposed to be, you know, quote, starving artists. Uh, and what also happens, the art becomes more expensive. So suddenly uh, it's not uncommon to, you know, start buying, you know, a painting for, you know, tens of thousands, maybe even, you know, a million dollars or something like that. Um, the art uh, becomes more elitist. So the people that are supporting the art, the people that are buying this art, are a very elite few. And their influence on that is that, you know, if you want to, um, you know, if you want to be successful as an artist, and, and nobody really wants to be a starving artist. You know, nobody wants to be starving. No one wants to be poor. Um, <laughs> so what happens is that you're going to also begin to... Uh, create art that speaks to to that group of people and 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 i can say this too is you know i work in the arts i work in theater um and you know you you're always getting people writing grants and stuff uh so that they can fund um you know a play or something like that and that's a real it's a 
an issue I have with all of this is that it's basically you're just chasing grant money. But when you and when you are chasing grant money, what happens is that well you you're going to you're going to appeal to the people that have the grant. So again, uh, this 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 uh, what starts as spontaneous begins to take a life of its own. The art becomes more expensive. The art becomes more elitist. Uh, the art becomes uh, larger than life, both in a figurative and in a literal sense. The art physically becomes bigger. So, uh, you know, you start to see like a, a Jackson Pollock that takes up, uh, you know, an entire apartment building. <laughs> you know, they, they physically, these, the canvases that they're using become bigger and bigger. Uh, again, I think kind of mimicking the, uh, the, the life that they have taken on. And again, as I said, the political leanings and the idealism of many of these of these artists also begins to change. So, you know, suddenly you have these artists that, uh, you know, were all about the working man uh, and they all have houses in the Hamptons. They all start wearing expensive suits. They start going to sophisticated parties with, uh, you know, high society in New York City. So they begin to change as well. And. I think what I find so fascinating about this is that in a lot of ways, abstract expressionism and modern art more generally becomes an extension of the elites. It becomes a commodity. It becomes uh, some, it, 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 you know, art, the way that we view it almost becomes like a toy for them. It's something that uh, they, they, they all want to kind of have a piece of. They all want to show it off to their friends that they were able to afford this, you know, $50,000 Mark Rothko painting. And that is um, that is a, a very fascinating phenomenon, especially given that there seemed to be this sort of brief window in American art post-World War II where – that void might have been differently. It might have, uh, might have, uh, you know, uh, taken on a, a different manifestation. But as I said in the in the first hour, you have people like Clement Greenberg, who are pushing the idea that the elites of America, the rich and the powerful, they must fund this stuff and they must direct it in a certain uh, direction because it's their job. So also what happens is, is you know, you begin uh, to see this, this connection being lost between regular people and art. And I think personally that that's bad for society. I think that's a negative thing. I think that, um, you know, I think it's very easy for people to go and, and, you know, you can go to MoMA, you can go to the, you know, the new museum, you can go anywhere in New York. And there is a disconnect with a lot of this art. And I think that um, there's a variety of factors for why that is, but I think that that's bad because that also trickles down. And then we begin to see, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, people, certain people in the alternative media and in other places in the alt community uh, begin to have this sort of hatred of uh, art and, and of modernism in particular. And I think that that's, uh, that's a bad thing because, I think what's so fascinating about, uh, let's say, abstract expressionism or abstract art in general is that it can elicit a feeling in you that um, can't be expressed in, a, in, say, a figurative drawing or sculpture. There is a power to this that can, uh, you know, make you think about things, make you think about ideas in a way that you wouldn't be able to. If you're, say, looking at a Rembrandt or something or, you know, or, uh, um, I don't know, a Da Vinci or, or, uh, Cezanne or something like that. There is a power to this art that, again, I think on some level the CIA understood as well. Beyond the political reasons for doing this, I think they also understood that this art has a power that is, um, is, is almost hidden to people. And again, if you really take the time and you look at, at some of the, you know, abstract expressionist paintings, there is this primal, uh, you know, desire or something that, that, that can be elicited from it. There is something that you can't put into words. You can't put into even like a, you know, a physical drawing or something. 
So uh, the the loss, this 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 loss of connection with everyday people is bad because then what happens is people begin to reject it. They begin to want to censor it. Uh, and you know, as I said too, much of this art and the artists themselves they begin to mirror the people that are funding them and that are buying them. So they begin to mirror the uh, elites in the world. And uh, I hope that this will kind of uh, bring it back. But, you know, I mentioned at the very beginning of this, um, you know, there's been a lot of scrutiny targeted at art recently uh, in relation to, the uh, the you know the the scandal which uh, shall remain nameless right now, <laughs> um, and uh, you know I think again that people don't fully understand how the art world works, and they don't understand that in a lot of ways um, the the way that you know abstract expressionism sort of set in many ways the groundwork for how contemporary art has morphed into the phenomenon that it is today. So, you know, contemporary artists now are, you know, they're part of the 1%. They are the elite because the only people that can afford it are the elitists. And again, contemporary art has become larger physically in scale and it's become, uh, you know, more sought after. It's become more and more expensive and I think in some ways that's not necessarily, um, you know, you look at someone, let's say, like a Marina Abramovich or, or no, you know, let, let's, look, let's actually f- skip that. Let's look at, uh, Louise Bourgeois, okay, who is a, um, a, you know, a very famous artist, um, associated, I guess, with like the feminist art movement, but also abstract expressionism. She has a very famous sculpture called the, uh, Arc of Hysteria. And this does hang in Tony Podesta's house. Now, it is a provocative looking, uh, sculpture. Uh, you know, you can go and Google it and look at it. It's, um, it, it does look disturbing. Um, it was made in 1993. Uh, and I've seen all of these people on the internet pointing to, oh, that Bourgeois made that because of Jeffrey Dahmer. Okay, because Jeffrey Dahmer would pose his victims in these contorted positions. And there is a, a one of Dahmer's victims was posed in uh, a position that looks just like the Ark of Hysteria, the Arch of Hysteria, excuse me. But that's not what that's about. The, 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 you know, what Bourgeois is really commenting on is the, the idea of the hysterical woman or, or of the idea of hysteria. Um, and the, the figure in that has no head. Uh, it has no genitalia. It does look masculine, but it's sort of, it can be whatever you want to think of it as. And that's not necessarily what she's doing. And I think people need to kind of like take a step back and understand that. That that's not quite what that art has become, but we've become, we, we've rejected so much of of uh, contemporary art that we can't look at something like that and not think that there's some sort of secret, you know, Oh, this is about Jeffrey Dahmer. Um, you know, I, I, I would, I just, there's no way that that's what Louis Bourgeois was, uh, was thinking of when she made that. But let's look at uh, Marina Abramovich, very controversial artist. I dislike her art uh, intensely. Um, but you know, is she creating performance pieces and other things that uh, she knows will attract a certain type of rich elitist? Absolutely, because that is what art has become. It has become about chasing money, uh, and it has become about uh, becoming more and more shocking. And again, you can look at the roots of that even in the abstract expressionist movement. Now, I don't think that they were trying to necessarily create shock art, but it certainly was shocking to the aesthetics and tastes of people of that time. It was certainly controversial uh, when viewed through the lens of, you know, European aesthetics. And a group of very powerful uh, men and women uh, behind the scenes helped to uh, promote this. They helped to um, make it into what it 
what it has now become. And the legacy of that, I think, has trickled down uh, to other. So then you can look at, like, you know, Jeff Koons, who's a complete psycho, makes god awful art, sells it for millions and millions of dollars. I mean, he's probably a billionaire. Um, and his art is only really purchased by people that are fellow billionaires. And what fills the void? You know, if we if we are if we're going to reject all this sort of art, if we're going to find uh, that that it, it is you know it, it needs to be censored and whatnot, what's the alternative that people are offering? Um, what's what's the answer to all of that? And that's a, a question I think that that. You know, I, I guess I'll pose to everybody out there listening to the alternative community that this is a question that I think we should we should really be pondering um, because art is important to a society uh, and it, it is something that I think we should all enjoy. Uh, and that doesn't mean that we all have to like modern art. You know, there's a ton of modern art I despise or contemporary art that I, I hate. Uh, I do like, you know, Rembrandt's and. Uh, Monet and, and, and stuff like, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that, that classical art or, um, you know, Renaissance art is, is something that we need to poo poo, but the, the way that people are now jumping to the conclusion that all of these artists are part of some sort of dark cabal when really is this a legacy of what in part began in the 1950s? In that, in in the promotion of this by a certain group of people, in the uh, the way that it's become more and more sought after and more and more expensive, so that only a certain group of people can purchase this art, does that influence the art? Does that influence the type of people uh, making art? I think it does, and I think that that's something that we need to understand, and we need to not dismiss all of this. You know, I think. Um, you know, are there some stuff that some paintings in Tony Podesta's house that are uh, that I find disturbing and and uh, shouldn't be seen? I guess so. Yeah. I mean, you know, the the, the Serbian painter is uh, not my cup of tea. But when we start censoring uh, art and stuff, even like that, then we open ourselves up for all sorts of repercussions. You know, who who begins to say what's acceptable and what's not? You know, we, we had this uh, in New York City back in the 90s with Giuliani and the whole degenerate art uh, show that, w- that was going on. And, and he wanted to get rid of it. And, he, you know, and, and it's that's a scary thing, you know, especially given that, uh, you know, the, the Nazis had, a you know, their whole they, they hated degenerate art um, and, and uh, you know, banned art and things like that. So I, I mean I know I'm, I'm kind of like all over the place right now uh, with uh, with what I'm saying, but um, I, I think that in a lot of ways to kind of like sum up that idea, um, we need to kind of take a, a closer look at this. We need to understand this, and we need to in some ways confront this. Um, while it is widely known that the CIA was involved in MoMA and in the Abstract Expressionist movement, I don't think it's widely known enough. Uh, and I don't think that people kind of fully understand the ramifications of that influence um, in terms of creating this extension of the elite in terms of artists. And, you know, and, and, and you know, what what happened uh, to the to the people that kind of started this movement that had a, perhaps had a, a political ideology or had a, a, a desire to influence society? Well, you know, uh, Jackson Pollock dies in a car crash in 56. Um, uh, Arshel Gorky uh, hangs himself, uh, I think, in the same year. Franz Klein, another uh, abstract expressionist, drinks himself to death. That's about six years later. Uh, At 65, the sculptor David Smith dies in a car crash. Uh, In 1970, Mark Rothko uh, opens up his veins and bleeds to death on his studio floor. And all of them did become the very thing that they sort of uh, feared and hated. They did become obsessed with materialism. They did become obsessed with uh, making money, with being famous, and all of these sort of things. And I think, again, that all of that has trickled down or trickled up uh, in terms of, of how art is created and how art is sold to people. And that's really bad because that's not what art 
art shouldn't be about that. Now, obviously, art has always been um, artists. There have always been artists that are going to be funded by the rich. The rich are going to have the money to support artists, and that is a reality. And that's something that um, you know we, we just sort of have to accept. But that doesn't mean that all art is like that, and that doesn't give us the right to start determining what's good art, what's bad art, what needs to be censored, what doesn't need to be censored. Uh, and again, what's the alternative? What fills that void? And I, I see, I, I, you know, I, I see a lot of people rejecting uh, art. Of course, you can find all of my work at PorkinsPolicyReview.com, and I will be talking to you all next week.